Welcome to another episode of the MMA Vivis section. I don't know. Is this like the fifth one I've done this week? We're th- I think it's three, probably, but whatever. I did like a four-hour one today with Connor, so it's that that's like five yeah. right there. There is nothing real. that great of, to talk about for that long. Good lord! I, it was only two hours, but whatever. I'm. I'm. It, it's supposed to be. I'm. Ex- I, I'm using hyperbole for dramatic effect, man. Don't, don't, don't harsh my buzz here. Got my mm. monologue going, and I, uh, you know. Anyway, we got this Invicta. We had a bunch of fight cards this week. It's not like I don't know that there's any. I mean, honestly. Tanya Evinger and Angela Hill and Benson Henderson might be like the biggest headliners this week on a week with two UFC shows back to back. Wow. That's saying a lot considering Musasi's one of them. So yeah, yeah. that's that's pretty fucked. I mean, Musasi's cool, but he's not, you know, he's, he's not cool like that. Shit. Yeah. He's still Musasi. <laughs> I mean, nobody's I mean, nobody's shit. building events. The, the closest <laughs> we've come to building an event around Gegard Musasi is fight pass cards. You know? No, I would even go back further. Like the most exposure he had really was back in the days of Dream. That's when you could actually, when he still had that mystique of, oh, he could be the next guy. Now, eh. yeah, he's fun. I like him, but you know, Ben Henderson actually had some pop for the UFC for a little while, for a minute. Anyway, because he can do all things through God and and hair hair products, good hair care, all things and through good things. hair care. <laughs> all right. On that note, we're here to talk Invicta FC twenty. I've uh, rambled enough, which is uh, headlined by bantamweight title fight Tanya Evinger versus Yana Kunitskaya, and a strawweight title fight Angela Hill versus Kayleen Medeiros. Uh-huh. And I am joined by Victor Rodriguez and Dio to break down these Invicta cards, as always. Uh-huh. Uh, Dio, first of all, what do you think of this card? Well, uh, it's cool at the top. I don't really know much else at the bottom of it. It's, uh, I mean, it's, we've said this on every vivisection of Invicta over like the past five, six events. You know, it's... It's not like super action packed top to bottom, but it's still pretty solid. So, and we get to see like prospects like Angela Hill continue to grow, which she needs, you know, after her UFC run. So, <laughs> excuse me. There you go. All right. On that closing note, beautiful. Didn't even mute or anything. You brought a tear to my eye. Exactly. What are your thoughts here, Vic? Well, you know what? I mean, it's, it's, we probably expected something a little bigger. I'm not sure how. But we're getting probably the most unexpected star that Invictus kicked uh, up in uh, Tanya Avenger. We're getting Angela Hill, you know, coming off one of the nicest rebounds we've seen in any brief career. Um, you know, just excitement and continuing to build in each division. The only maybe minor complaint, it would have been nice to see a featherweight fight or, you know, something like that here. Some of the, you know, the higher weight class. But I'm not, that's not really a complaint. It would have probably been cool, but it's it's still it would have been a nice addition. But other than that, this is kind of your usual Invicta Fair, kind of low key, but it's stylistically set up to deliver some pretty good stuff. And I don't know where they keep finding these women on the regional scene, but they've got some pretty exciting looking prospects on the bottom end and uh, some guaranteed action at the top. So it's definitely a yet another one that's going to likely be high fire. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, I, I always feel like it's. With a lot of these Invicta cards, it's pretty much the best that they can do. You got uh, two cha- two title fights at the top, former champ and Herrick Tiburcio uh, underneath that, and then a bunch of decent fighters who are winning at the very least and getting experience. A couple of pro- couple of really raw prospects, but they got to keep finding people. So mm-hmm. there's just not a lot of other things that Invicta is going to be able to do, considering that they've got to compete at, for top talent with Bellator and the UFC both for the big yeah. names. So on that note, let's take a look. Let's start on this undercard, drive our way through this. I actually need to pull up. Oh, good. There are a few fight odds for this thing. I thought there would be by now. So let's start out at the very bottom. Miranda Maverick versus Samantha Diaz. Vic, what do you know about this fight? 
Well, starting off with Maverick, uh, she's seven and one as an amateur, and she's making her pro debut here with five submissions and one TKO. Very much uh, keen on using her lower body strength, you know, pushing against the cage. Uh, you know, the kind of takedowns that she sort of initiates, a lot of the head and arm throws, a lot of, you know, using of the uh, leg as a sticking point. Got something of a penchant for arm bars. She's always hunting for that submission, and she is just very, very aggressive. So that could also, that could be, this could be kind of a sleeper in that sense. We might see something of a coming out party here. And uh, on the other end, you got Samantha Diaz, who's 5-0 and as an amateur with, uh, what's that, three submissions? All of them arm bars and, um, you know, more a wily submission grappler type fighter. Not too much in the stand-up department. We could see a pretty fun grappling match out of this. Now, a winner or a loss doesn't necessarily say too much because, again, they're both making their pro debuts. But um, it could be a sign of things to come, and they have a nice little uh, amateur background to, uh, to fall back on here, uh, meaning that they're not going to be too raw, you know. So it, it, it certainly seems like it could be a hell of a lot of fun. You got a pick to make? Uh, I'm going to go with Maverick on this one. Physicality, and she seems a little more savvy with her positions and when to go for submission. And her name's Maverick. Come on. You yeah, you kind of got to go with that. You, you hear the Sarah Palin voice, you had Maverick. You know, it's like, hey, you know, Alaska, stand up. Stop I'm looking, oh, God, I'm looking no, at you, man, it. in the middle. Alaska, sit down. Stop please. it. Please, please sit down, Alaska. Um, all right, Dio. Yeah. What do you uh, I like, guess the thing, like the bottom two, <laughs> since they're still pretty new, I couldn't yeah. really find too, too much on them. Um, but from what I did see, though, like Maverick is really strong for her size, like farmer strong. <laughs> so I'm going to go with Maverick because she's got the cool name and she's got the farmer strength. All right. They don't I, want- I had a few <laughs> lessons from Matt Hughes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, pounding her brother behind the bar. <laughs> exactly. If she's pounding her brother behind the bar barn, then All right. I, got, I, I got questions. I have Less a lot of questions. About that, the I don't have those questions. Smooth transition. Yet. Smooth transition. Smooth transition. We got a featherweight or bantamweight <laughs> fight here. Stephanie Egger versus Alexa uh, Alexa Connors. Dio, what are your thoughts? Uh on this one, I'm going to go with the winning record <laughs> in Stephanie Egger. Um, yeah, because really couldn't find too much on these. I was, yeah, I had a crappy connection at work today. So, yeah. All right. You're going with the winner. Okay. Vic, enlighten us if you can. If you can't, then just back up what Dio said. All right, Stephanie Egger is a very high-level judo black belt, and she's 2-0 as a professional. Didn't find anything that had to do with an amateur record, although she does have one TKO and one submission win. Now, on the other hand, you have Alexa Connors, who's 7-1 and as an amateur, three TKOs and one submission, and the only losses she's got is to Sajara Eubanks, who we've seen at Invicta. Now, losing to someone who's that strong, not really anything to be ashamed of. And she does have a win over Andy Nguyen, who's kind of been putting together a couple of nice wins on the regional circuit, too. So um, I would probably say Alexa Connors, by virtue of being more well-rounded. Uh, again, didn't really see much of anything for Agar, but uh, Connors at least has some striking ability that we can see. And, uh, you know, at least she's got a more uh, extensive, relatively, record on the uh, amateur uh, scene. So, you know, I guess you kind of have to go with her. She seems more experienced as far as this goes. You hear that, dear? You have to go with her. You have, you have to, to go with her. her. <laughs> you have to. No can be fed. up, man. <laughs> All right. That takes us to a, another strawweight contest. Lynn Alvarez, JJ Aldrich. Vic, what are your thoughts on this fight? Well, here's the problem with this fight, and it's the fact that Lynn Alvarez has been around since, I believe, 2007. Um, she took some time off. She's, I believe, had some injuries and family life, and she's been kind of in and out. And so it's maybe until it's been like the last year and a half to two years that she's been able to jump back in. Um, she, I, I don't really know what to make of her at this point. Um, her striking is good. Uh, her wrestling is pretty decent. Her submission game is okay, but Audric is coming up you know she's younger she's hungrier she's 
pretty fast uh, when it comes to uh, switching from one aspect of the fight game to the other, whether it's, you know, going from striking to grappling or the other way around. So uh, I'm going to have to go with Aldrich on this one. She's just she's just able to take a hit and keep on going, and she is just relentless when it comes to chanting her submissions or at least keeping the position to keep punishing her opponent. So uh, I'm going to go with Aldrich on this one. Do you have your thoughts? I am also going with Aldrich on this one. Um... And just because she was the – before Jamie Moyle choked her into oblivion, she was, like, the hot up-and-coming prospect coming out of the uh, amateur scene. And Lynn Alvarez has just been up, down, can't – like, just hasn't been super consistent in her career uh, thus far. Still, you know, pretty solid in most areas, but I don't want to say that this is, like, a gimme fight for Aldrich, but this is definitely – a proper step up in competition for someone like her. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see who Alvarez has lost to. It's in a way Esparza and Aguilar, and then way, way early Angela Magana. But uh, she hasn't really beat that many fighters either. So it's kind of an interesting position where every, all the decent fighters on a roll have beat her. But yeah, that may be, may be Aldrich here, too. Lo- certainly losing to Tatiana Suarez on tough doesn't say anything bad about her. Suarez looks pretty damn good. No, Suarez was a national champion, wasn't she? Yeah. I didn't see that season. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go on. Feather or Another Bantamweight fight. Jesse Rose Clark versus Pam Sorensen. Dio, what are your thoughts on this? Um, on this one, so this one's a bit of a strange one because it looks like Pam Sorensen, this is her first time at 135 or like when I was looking at the weights in previous fights, I think she fought at like 155 at one point before and was coming down. Sorensen, I'm only seeing 135 on Tapology, but I can't be sure about that. I think she fought at 145 at some point because she fought Amber Lee Brock. There. So... It may be amateur. Yeah, amateur she yeah. may have been heavier, but not pro. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, but from what I could tell, um, on this one I'm going with Jesse Rose Clark. Um, just from what I saw, just her game all around just seemed to be a little bit better. But, I, yeah, it's kind of a tough one because can't really. I didn't really see a whole bunch uh, from Sorensen from when I was looking online to formulate a large, a really good idea as to what you can do. All right. Vic, what are your thoughts? I'm actually going to go with Sorensen on this one. Uh, Sorensen's 4-1 and one with one TKO. Um, she does have a mention. Uh, we just mentioned Amber Lee Brock. She does have an amateur loss to Amber Lee Brock, which is a knockout, and that's expected. I mean, we've seen what Lee Brock can do in Invicta. Yeah. Uh, other than that, she does also have a win against regional, you know, knockaround fighter Brenda Gonzalez. So there's not really that much of note. But what you do notice in some of her fights, I mean, she does have a stout frame. She does seem to have that ability to, you know, sort of just weigh on her opponent. You know, as soon as she initiates that clinch, make him carry that weight. You know, much like a Francis Carmont type thing. You know, and no, don't, um, don't 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 say that, please. please. <laughs> no, nah, listen. Listen, I got, I have to, okay? Now, uh, Clark is, she's not a bad fighter at all, man. She's pretty savvy. She, she has, um, you know, she has the mindset for the MMA game. What, what worries me is the physicality aspect. I don't think she's going to be able to push Sorensen around. I don't think she's really going to be able to get anything going off her back if it gets to that point. And I don't really, you know, while she probably has more polished striking, I don't see her really doing the kind of damage to put Sorensen away. Whereas I could see Sorensen probably cracking her and hurting her and then, you know, working from there. So I'd probably have to see Sorensen might win this one by decision. Got to say, though, I'm looking at Tapology, and Jesse Rose Clark does have a very lovely 90s, uh, like, oh, that headshot is great. BB's headshot, <laughs> snapshot photo. Yeah, that, that looks like she's uh, going to be on some show that won't be around next season, like Acapulco Heat. Exactly. <laughs> like yeah. one of those Baywatch spinoffs or something like yeah. that. Baywatch Nights, when they turn into the X-Files. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When they were fighting the electric eel was just the most amazing <laughs> trash I had ever seen as a kid. My God. <laughs> and, and we've seen a lot of trash. A oh, lot. That brings Growing up. Island TV. Shit. Island the TV. <laughs> <sighs> Gentlemen, please. This is a serious <sighs> endeavor. 
Okay, Zany Poo, let's go. Ah, oh, God, you're killing me. Killing me. Uh, we got a strawway bout next. Ashley Yoder, Amber Brown, and uh, Vic, tell me about this fight. But, you know, I, I kind of like the fact that the, the questions that, that come up here immediately are, uh, we saw Amber Brown fight for the um, Adam Way title against Hamasaki in what was a really, really great fight earlier in the year. And, um, you know, now we're going to see her moving up to uh, straw weight to fight Ashley Yoder, who was on The Ultimate Fighter. Um, she did fairly well. She beat Jody Escobel to get into the house. And, um, you know, she's, she's had a pretty good record for someone who's young and coming up on the um, regional circuit. Now she is... Well, she's 29. So, I mean, she's relatively, she's young in the sport because she's only been around fighting since, what, 2014. Um, still, Amber Brown, man, she's just so physical. You know, she's able to use her wrestling so, so well. And, uh, you know, she's just able to start hitting people until they quit. And I'm kind of wondering if that's going to be something that now she doesn't have to cut as much weight. She might be able to bully Yoder around to that point. So, uh I'm going to probably have to go with Amber Brown on this one just because of that. All right. Dia, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm also going to have to go with Brown on this one. What we, uh, like Most of what I saw with Yoder was from uh, on Tough, and Tough is a really bad measuring stick when it comes to assessing someone's ability. One, because you're having these bullshit you know, weight cuts in very you know, short amounts of time. Um, she was decent, nothing that was spectacular that said, oh, yeah, this is good. But Brown is, if there was, there's like maybe five or six people in all of MMA that actually have nicknames that make sense. And Amber Brown is one of them because that is what she does. She will go in and she's going to bully you. Uh, you know, she did really well against Hamasaki, and I don't think there's going to be anybody else in whether it's atom weight or straw weight that are going to be able to match what she can do physically. There's very few, maybe one or two people uh, at straw weight that are going, what the hell are you drinking over there, Vic? Moonshot. I got some rum. Oh, of course. No, I'm not kidding. No, seriously. It's all right. No, I, nobody doubts that you're drinking rum, man. No, I, yeah. <laughs> the doubt here is not that you're drinking hardly. What is that? You got to talk, Dio. We can't see it if you don't talk. Black Seal. Ooh. Black Seal, 140 proof. Good stuff. Ooh. Uh, but yeah anyhow back to what we were saying uh amber brown is the bully and it makes sense because she bullies people all right and you're picking her of course yeah all right the odd mainly because i'm afraid that she's going to come to my house and whoop my ass so yeah (laughs) that's always a legit fear uh odds makers are picking amber brown as well she's a favorite minus 285 to minus to plus 205 for ashley yoder so, as the underdog. And uh, that brings us to a atom weight bout between former champion, atom weight champion, Erica DiBurcio and Simona Sukupova. Dio, what are your thoughts on this fight? This is, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. <laughs> uh, Erica DiBurcio, who, as you said, she's former uh, Adam Wade champion is just like a small, compact murder ball. And Sukupova is like, if you try to make someone out of rocks using rocks, you'd have her. So, but as far as fight breakdown goes, uh, I'm going to go with Tabersi on this one um, just because she's stupidly tough. Like, ridiculously tough and he's just a little fire hydrant when it comes to uh, grappling and the like. So that's who I'm going to go with. Vic, say some words. All right. Dio's just, <laughs> Dio's just got caught up thinking about the, the like belly shirt thing she wore in, in her first invictus. I'm still battle. pissed about that shit, actually. <laughs> that looked pretty, that looked really kind of, I, I don't know. That looked <laughs> low, right? Right, but it was I still have, bullshit. I thinking about it too now. Vic, talk about this fight. Yeah, please. Let me get our minds off of that shit. Okay. So Gopova uh, might not sound like she's, you know, that uh, 
intimidating an opponent. But I think we also have to look at the fact that she has probably been a victim of being thrown in against some people that she probably should not have been fighting at that time. Um, She did fight and beat Celine Haga back in 2010. And Haga, it should be noted, just got signed by Invicta. She's been on a tear after going through a horrible string of losses, kind of like Mata Ferry. Uh, So she's really turned things around and gotten a lot better. So that win probably doesn't mean as much since she was kind of raw. She does have a loss to Carla Benitez, who we just saw in Bellator last week, a loss to Felice Herrig, a split draw, curiously enough, I guess, against former champion Katya Kankanpa. Uh, Let me see. Cassie Rodish, she's got a win against by submission, and that was the uh, fight that she had in 2013. And then that was followed by a unanimous decision loss to Karolina Kowalkiewicz. Um, look, I I don't really know where her mindset is, but as far as the physical tools are concerned, she certainly seems like she might definitely have, uh, an advantage as far as her uh, athleticism and her physicality. Her striking is not as well put together as perhaps someone who's been in the fight game for as long as she has should be. She is 39 years of age. I don't know if that's going to be as much of a factor. But uh, she is still pretty strong, and she does have an okay MMA game overall. Problem is she's going to be fighting a former champion here who has been, again, also someone who probably fought some people she shouldn't have at a certain point. But, I mean, you know, Tiburcio has got a hell of a resume too. She has a loss to Claudia Gadelia. She does have a win over Aline Saddlemeyer and eventually the big one, the shocking upset win over Michelle Watterson that netted her that belt. Um Subsequently lost it to a Yakahama Saki, who we've seen become awesome after that. And then that was also followed by a loss to Jenny Frey, who, again, we've also seen has done really well for herself. So just quality of opposition and succeeding against higher level opponents, um, or at least doing what better in, in her losses, I'd have to say that Tiburcio would have the advantage here. She's just very dangerous when it comes to her striking. Very unexpected how she closes the distance and how she's able to negate the range advantage that some of her opponents might have. Um, and she's just really smart about her angles, man. She listens to her coaches. You kind of hear how these things go and, and how she's able to perform. So I'm going to have to go to Bercy on this one. Um, not sure how exactly, but I, uh, I think she's got more going for her on this one. And one thing just to harp on about that is that Vic said is she closes distance and negates reach at an alarming rate for someone that's her size. Like we got to remember, she's only four foot 11 and she, you would expect people that are taller than her that have more, a longer reach would have a far easier time. And that's just not the case. Well, so, part of it's got to be that like five foot two women, five foot three women aren't used to punching down to anyone. Right. <laughs> to anyone. And, and suddenly they're up, faced with someone face. that they got to like, who's like coming up at them from underneath. And it's like, what the hell? Well, I mean, like, Tamarissa was just fast. And she, you know what's funny is like, yeah. she's, she's one of those people that's really good at setting up her feints. And I mean, I don't know if it's a product of training or just the culture or what, but. We haven't seen too many women's fighters that are as active with their feints. Um, you know, it's, it's, we've seen very few of that, very few women that are able to do that that successfully. So uh, it's kind of a welcome thing to see someone who's able to implement it like that. So that, that's been working out for her. I think it's been part of the key to their, to their success. Yeah. Mercio is a big favorite here, coming in at minus 705. Uh, Simona Sukupova at plus 435. So really, really wide odds there. Um, that brings us to the co-main event, a strawweight title fight, Angela Hill defending the belt against Kayleen Medeiros and Dio. What are your thoughts? First and foremost, Angela Hill won the, uh, weigh in costumes. Just again, again, again. As she always does. Yeah. Like she's undefeated pound for pound best cosplayer in MMA. Um, on this one, uh, who yeah, Angela Hill, who has had an amazing career resurgence. I shouldn't even really say a resurgence because she's still really new to MMA. She just had, like, the worst murderer's row uh, while she was in the UFC for someone that only had a f- handful of, of fights on her uh, she resume. She was 2-0 oh at the time. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, she was 1-0 one, one yeah, oh at the time she oh. got to the UFC. 
Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which you know did nothing for as far as development goes. Um, and in this fight, I expect her. Well, she's gonna have the advantage in the striking uh, battle against Maderos. Um, Maderos is you know pretty well rounded, uh, but in this one, I just think Hill's got too much firepower and is going to have a little, not a little bit, but a lot better uh, stand up. You're picking Hill. I'm picking Hill. Yeah. By TKO round three. All right, Vic, what are your thoughts? That's that's a cool, precise pick. I like that. He's All bold. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we cool. reward boldness. Yes, boldness, yes. Witness me. Um, all right, let's <laughs> – I, I want to start off with Colleen Medeiros for a moment because I think it's um, – worth sort of examining here she had a very early win back in 2012 against former title challenger stephanie Agick. that's pretty impressive um she eventually got a loss to peggy morgan again this was just she was starting off as a pro uh eventually got a win over brigitte narcisse the super tough grappler who runs the k dojo pretty much you know as, as, as head it should uh, be noted that peggy morgan is also a full person larger than her a that is person. yes very much uh, something that should be noted. She does have a loss to one of our favorite people, Oklahoma's own and former Ultimate Fighter contestant Chelsea Bailey. Um, yeah, we're not going to do this again. We're not going to do this again. No. Uh, and a win over Sarah Pyant that she had in Bellator. She kicked around over the New England scene and then ended up in Bellator, then Legacy, and then she landed in Invicta. And she is currently one, two, three, four, five fights in a row that she's won and she's looked pretty good man she's you know um she's been able to just control the opponent and push a pace that they can't really keep you know, she's just wild in there and and it's it's um it's sort of like a controlled chaos type thing you know she's just able to just blitz her opponent and and, and just bring a lot of tenacity uh, problem is she's, she's going to be fighting. <laughs> well, she's going to be fighting one of the most improved fighters, and what I think is one of the quickest turnarounds that we've seen in the sport in a very long time. Um, Angela Hill. It's very likely that she made it to the Ultimate Fighter because she was replacing one of the three fighters that was unable to make it originally. Uh, it should be worth mentioning it for that season. Claudia Gadelia had visa issues. Juliana Lima did not speak English, and Paige Van Zant was too young to be on the show. So Alcohol. those three were replaced. And um, I, it seems that Angela Hill at 1-0, and they relied on her uh, kickboxing experience and her personality and everything to fill in that spot. And that's kind of how she got on. And, you know, she did what she could in the UFC, but it just wasn't enough. And now she has become a much more complete mixed martial arts fighter. That hand that just dropped Alita Gray was, was frightening to watch. The ability yeah. that she has to turn a fight around with one shot is is just great. And the way she sets up her shots is also great to watch. So um, Angela Hill is just so much more focused and composed. Submission threats are not really that big a deal anymore. She's able to work her way out of bad positions. And uh, I really don't see any avenue for Medeiros to succeed in this, even if she's able to take Hill down. It's like you're not going to be able to keep her down for very long. Keep her down for yeah, and no, the level her, of athleticism and explosiveness is just... And, and also, her cardio seems to not really have been that big a factor in her last uh, few fights. So um, I really think Angela Hill has all the tools and all the uh, elements really to win this fight. So I, I'm pretty much going with that. It should also be noted, too, that Kaylee Medeiros, while she's on a good win streak and you know she's had some tough fights out there, like... Manjit Kolkar did actually give her a tough fight Which last is time out. And Kolkar, Kolkar showed – I mean, she showed that she's actually a really good athlete. Yeah, who very good raw not, talent. Yeah, who, who just does not have much training. But it's still like somebody without much training really gave her a tough fight. And Angela Hill is a really good athlete with quite a lot of good training. So – you know. And with stellar training partners as well, that should yeah. be noted. Because she, from what I understand, she's another one of those women that trains with a bunch of the men down at Alliance. So um, you got that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I expect Angela Hill to keep rolling here. Uh, odds makers have that as well. Angela Hill is the favorite, minus five oh five to plus three thirty five. So she's coming in as a wide favorite. Sounds about right. 
And that brings us to our final headlining bout, the bantamweight title, Tanya Evinger, Yana Konitskaya. Vic, what are your thoughts on this fight? <laughs> like, we're seriously doing this? Oh, wow. Um, Somebody can get their ass kicked. <laughs> sure, I guess so. Okay, uh, Kuniskaya, she is a very tough fighter. I'm not going to take anything away from her on that end. But you got to look at her record that currently stands at 9-2, and two, and you got to know, I think it was two or three opponents that were 1-0 and oh, and that still are, and there's one opponent who's 2-0 and oh, and still is. Other than that, she hasn't really beaten anyone of note recently. I mean, she did beat Cindy Dandois back when she was only a grappler and prior to really getting her thing together within the last two years. And she had a loss against Maria Hugard Yursa back in 2010. Not sure what that really says in the scope of, you know, what kind of fighter she is today. Uh, other than that, she fought uh, Yanan Wu back in um, that uh, uh, Vasilevsky, Vasilevsky versus uh, Matt Horwich event back in uh, oh, last month. So there's that, I suppose. It, it's a fight that really didn't tell us much. It was over pretty much quickly in the uh, beginning of the second round, and that's pretty much it. She's got a karate-based style, it seems. It's, she's very big on kicks more than anything else. She leans on that quite heavily, more so than her boxing. That's going to get her into a lot of trouble when you got somebody who's got crisp combinations and really good hands and great use of range in Tanya Avenger. Look, we all saw Irene Aldana come up through the ranks in Invicta, put on hellish performances against some of these opponents that she'd faced, putting people away with, you know, setting things up with her hands and then going with a submission if she had to or just straight brutalizing people with her boxing. And if Tanya Avenger can outbox her, yeah, and that other Same. woman is now in the UFC. I don't see yeah. this guy really giving her that kind of opposition that'll, you know, give her that kind of challenge. Maybe, maybe there will be some sort of a thing. You know, maybe she can take a hit better than we think, and she can use that to, uh, you know, tough it out and start working stuff from the clinch. But Evanger's wrestling man. I mean, you know, she had a high school record. You know, she's 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 out there. She's uh, her grappling has been. We've seen it before, and we've seen her just improve every single time she's out there. And so far, the only person that's really given her a a, a very close, tight fight in Victa was Colleen Schneider. And really, it says more about Schneider than anything else. I mean, she's also improved a lot. So yeah, but this guy is unfortunately not on that level, man. I don't really see her succeeding, and that's going to probably be very ugly for her. Yeah, uh, it's hard to see. I mean, looking at the the women Kanitskaya has fought, honestly, Kanitskaya looks like a better fit for Bellator and their their fight booking preferences. The, yeah, the I mean, Foxy, could also do the boxing, oh, boxing the, stuff they do now. the Foxy nickname, the the can <laughs> crushing record. That that's uh, it'll be. Th- this is going to be interesting. I have to think. Maybe I don't. Know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Invicta just didn't have a better option. For Avenger in bantamweight, that could easily be the case. You know, there aren't a ton of. I mean, there's not really a ton of people outside of the UFC at 135 that are really going to pose a threat. No, I mean to most people, even in like the top five, like Kuniskaya is like she's fought a bunch of overmatched opponents for what six, seven years now, and you know she's done well against them, but. Tanya Evinger is the undertaker of women's 135, and that karate shit will get your ass kicked real quick. Like, you know, yeah. like, I know like a lot of folks watch him and like, oh, so and so's good. You know, they, they've got really good karate. Yeah, it doesn't work all the time. It's not like a magic bullet that instantly mean. You know, it's not like in the Karate Kid where you know, no can defend. Yeah, nah, black belt over defend. the course of a summer. Yeah, I know. Right. People can defend and they'll beat your ass. And well, Tanya Evinger is one of those people. Listen, this isn't Machida Karate where she's able to use her movement to fluster an opponent and be able – it's just simply the body kicks. It's the way she strikes is karate, not the way she moves. You understand? Right. So that's where it becomes a bit of a thing. She's fought some opponents that have been undersized. She's definitely fought some opponents that were not that talented. And she's going to be fighting a woman that, frankly, really ought to be in the UFC right now and could be giving anybody in that division, even the champion, a tough fight. So, I mean, it's a very tall order right there, man. It really is. Yeah. This seems like a walk for Avenger, but it's probably also 
you know, what what what, the, what can they do? You, you're yeah. picking from a limited talent pool. You got to have people that are ready to fight who can take a fight on your schedule. Yeah. This is the Especially fight you end when, up with. Like people like Aldana are going yeah. over to the UFC now, so you know. And Schneider just, Schneider went to Bellator. That would have been a great rematch, but you know, it's not there. So I'm just yeah. I was just looking at the uh, the rankings, the uh, topology rankings for the worldwide for women and you know i don't know where kaufman's at right now i know she recently got cut from the uc on you know it's on two losses or didn't have her contract extended and yeah. otherwise you know when you're talking about fighters who aren't in the ufc the first person you get to is larissa pacheco who also got cut and then Penny kianzad who she just beat and colleen schneider who's now in bellator and then Cindy Dandois, and you start getting into people who are kind of part-time featherweights, basically. Yeah, yeah. She beat she beat Kanzad pretty badly too, which is a shame because Kanzad got yeah. a lot of upside there. And I think she fought. She submitted Dandois, didn't she? Uh, I believe so. I believe she did. Let yeah. me uh, double check there. No, I'm pretty sure Ooh, she did. Dandois. No, she that was TKO. Oh, well, there you go. Right. Either way, and it was and it was a terrible TKO. That was back in the day when no, I'm Dandois. Sorry, no. No, that's not right. It was a submission. It was an arm bar. Oh. Anyway, the, you that know, the, the closest you get in Invicta already is like uh, Aspen Ladd, who's only 21. And, you know, that could be – she could be on the, her way to getting rushed into a title shot in the near future if she's Which not watching that. not good because, you know, five fights down the line – I could see her being a legitimate threat because yeah. she is a monster, but she's super raw. Yeah. So the odds on this fight, Avengers coming in minus seven Oh five. Can it sky up plus four thirty five? Not much surprise there. Any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you can hear me and Dio talk a whole bunch of wildcat shit as we did last week on my podcast. I don't know if you heard of it. Bodega well, superstar. That shit is out there. And it was, uh, it was interesting. It wasn't as funny as we would have wanted it to be, but it was cool. So it was like, cathartic. That, yeah, we we really needed that. That that was uh, that was something else. So yeah. But yeah, there's that, and I'll probably have a podcast sometime soon about the pro wrestlings and such. So all right, I, so, I know the listeners will love that. <laughs> we got pro wrestling. We got whatever bodega thing. Whatever you minorities do, I don't know. God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he went there. You can find me on Twitter at the Zane Simon. You can find Vic on Twitter at Vic and Rodriguez. You can find Dio on Twitter at I'm Just Dio. You can find Vic and I over on Bloody Elbow. You can find Dio trolling folks sometimes, occasionally, mostly, mostly on Twitter these days. Yes, and. Uh, I'll be back for the sixth round post-fight show after the UFC events on Saturday. And then we'll be kicking it off for uh, UFC Melbourne next week. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you next time.